Pokemon! You know Pokemon? I know Pokemon, you know Pokemon, your congressman probably knows Pokemon. Throw a stone into a crowd and you'll probably hit someone who can name this guy. Uh... Rocco. It's kind of hard to even write an intro for Pokemon, cause... What, am I supposed to assume you don't know what Pokemon is? It's a lot easier to introduce a GameCube game nobody cares about than Pokemon, cause who doesn't get this guy's deal immediately? Everyone who grew up with Pokemon has kept up with it whether you still play the games or not. Pokemon has breached the cultural mainstream to the point that every Pokemon, regardless of how barbarical they are, has a fan. Look at it like this. Pokemon is a franchise where almost every single character is the mascot of the franchise. It just depends on who's looking at it. And a common question for Pokemon fans when they were younger was, which Pokemon would you want in real life? Everybody had answers for what Pokemon they'd want in real life, from the basic picks like Bulbasaur, Charmander, and Squirtle, to the more fantastical picks like Electrode and Nidoking, to the kid who made up new rules in the middle of a game of tag so he wouldn't lose and he'd pick Mewtwo, to the people who'd pick Gardevoir, who should be cast off from modern society to live underground. It's this simple playground question though that raises the question, which Pokemon would be the best pet in real life? Now unlike with boxing and war crimes, there isn't really a defined set of rules on what makes a good pet. Oh, your dog got a bad grade, you raised a real D tier dog, look at its paws, it sucks! So what am I supposed to do, grade them on the same scale that they do at the Westminster Dog Show? Okay, yeah, few problems. One, those dogs are bred to run across a stick. La, and I mean this next part, D-da. Second, that system would work for exactly Growlithe because we'd get stumped at trying to figure out how Alakazam works into that system. So unlike before, I kinda had to do a lot more personal work. I'm coming at this from as impartial a viewpoint as possible, as to not let my bias towards hair cross overtake reason. As such, there may be some Pokemon that you like getting bad grades, and some jinx that you don't like getting good grades. At the end of the day though, it's the quality of the trainer and not the Pokemon that draws out its real potential, and any one of these creatures could be your friend for life. Except for Primate, he definitely hates you. So I needed five categories that covered enough ground as to not leave any blind spots in judging them. The five I came up with I think apply pretty well to grading a pet and more specifically a Pokemon. First is housing. When picking a pet, you have to factor in a lot of things, one of which being where are you gonna put it? Some dog breeds excel in smaller environments, some need wide open ranges in order to run around and burn off energy, and if you don't take into account what environment your pet needs before you pull the trigger, you're gonna have a nightmare on your hands. My tireless and clinical research has deduced that keeping a fish in a tank with water is going to vastly improve its longevity. So Pokemon that score a 5 in this regard will usually be extremely easy to house without any special conditions. Eevee, small dog, fun face, doesn't take up a lot of space. Onyx, rock snake, 28 feet long, can't be held anywhere except large cave systems, and those don't exactly come standard in a lot of apartments. Hypoallergenic though, you gotta give it that. And if you think you can just keep it in the Pokeball all the time, all right, Buster Brown, what's the point of a cat if you never get to see it? You're adopting a pet, not losing a child in divorce court. After that is the aspect that makes Pokemon so special compared to just getting a hamster like a normal human being, typing. Simple truth is that there are certain types of Pokemon that are by their nature safer to be around than others. Grass types, normal types, fairy types, generally friendly and harmless. Poison types, ghost types, and fire types, however, are a recipe for disaster. I had to take each type and assign them a point value based on how safe they are to be around. You're seeing on screen right now what each type managed to get. You may also be asking about dual typed Pokemon. There are tons that mix and match types ranging from grass fairies being absolutely lovely to poison ghosts being turbo satan. Well, for those instances, I simply added their points together and got an average. So for instance, ice water types get a seven out of 10 and on a five point scale, that's a 3.5. After that is behavior. This is where a lot of Pokedex reading was necessary to see how exactly each Pokemon will act. When I say a lot of Pokedex reading, I mainly mean gen seven as most of the other generations will say, this friendly Pokemon enjoys berries and head pats. Look out for its shocking sparks. Whereas Stone Cold Alola says, one time a young man pitted this thing and his heart stopped and he died! Now there is evidence of basically every Pokemon going against these dex entries and being perfectly behaved. The amount of people who have managed to domesticate Gengar is proof of that. As such, it's safe to say that any Pokemon, no matter how surly, can be taught to stop eating babies for fun. This category is more about trying to figure out how easy a process that's going to be. Pokemon that rank highly in this category are going to be super easy to train and require little to no extra care. Pokemon that rank lowly are the type 
type of pet that you need to smash in the head with a steel chair to get them to pee on the newspaper. After that is safety. You don't bring home a dog that you know is going to be violent, and you don't bring home a muck if its whole body is made of death. This is sort of a mix between type and behavior, but differs as a Pokemon that's well behaved in their deck entry can still be dangerous by virtue of Oh, I don't know, having exposed flames on their body. Pokemon who rank highly here present little to no danger to even the dumbest member of your family, and Pokemon that rank lowly are going to kill somebody. It's not a matter of if, just when. It might not have even meant it, but it still happened. Finally is ease of care. How much is it going to cost to keep this thing happy and healthy? How easy is it to access the food for this thing? And how many hoops do I have to jump through for it? Pokemon that do well in this category will take little to no effort to take care of, or in some cases even be self-sufficient. And the Pokemon that rank lowly are going to require you to feed it newborn baby souls, and trust me, they like their food fresh. Ultimately, they're gonna be graded on a scale of zero to 25. On screen now are some of the different ranges of grades it can get. Great pets will fit in with anybody, good pets may require some research, okay pets are going to need specialized care, bad pets are only for the experienced, and terrible pets will kill you a hundred times out of a hundred. Also, if your reading comprehension isn't up to snuff and there are too many words in the title, this is going to be exclusively Kanto to start out with, because if you haven't noticed, they won't stop making these things! Also, we're mainly going to be grading the final forms of these Pokemon, since you're going to be having a dog a lot longer than you have a puppy. There are going to be some exceptions, however, for Pokemon with evolved forms that nobody will ever take over their pre-evolutions. Besides, it's not like there are going to be a lot of cases where baby Pokemon are majorly different from their adult forms. Though I just can't condone Gengar, it's, it's too much! Oh, f yeah, ghastly. No kid growing up ever said, Oh man, I can't wait till I'm older so I can own a Raichu. How many of you want to own a Wigglytuff? Honestly, honestly, who wants to own a Wigglytuff? Don't you want to see your dog get a top eight? And if you get upset at one of your favorite Pokemon being too low on the list for your liking, I'm not talking about your muck, I'm talking about somebody else's. Your muck, I'm sure, is lovely, but this one eats babies. Now all that's left to do is the easy part. Just gotta plug the Kanto Pokemon into my system and see who the top dog is. Should be simple, right? How many distinctive evolutionary lines are there in Gen 1 any? <laughs> So that's a bit of a higher ask than 13 and 9 that I'm used to, so uh, I'll cut you a deal. We'll give most of the Pokemon a decent run through and tell you whether you'd want them to know where you sleep or not, grouped together by their overall grade. Then at the end we'll cover the top 5 best and top 5 worst pets. Please? With a grand total of three, we have just two Pokemon lucky enough to escape the bottom five. Electrode's discussion begins and ends at the fact that it's one bad shake away from exploding. That and it's taken to running away to power plants to drain them of all their electricity, which causes them to float. And they've gotta stop floating eventually, which means they're going to fall onto your house and explode. You can either adopt an electrode or stick a fork in an electrical plug. They're equally beneficial for your health. Obviously having Vile in the name can be a turn off, but come on, a rose by any other name would smell just as sweet. Except this rose is a Rafflesia, a kind of flower that smells like if death didn't shower. Vile Bloom's only good stat is its typing, with the normally amazing grass being cut in half by Poison's big fat zero. Speaking of poison, this Pokemon is lousy with it. I speak no lie when I say that Vileplume disperses heavy clouds of poison with every step it takes. You won't have a hard time caring for it since you just need water and sun, but good luck getting to the watering can before you drop dead. At a whopping four points is an appropriate four Pokemon, each of whom fail in some spectacular new way from each other. Not only is he a bad evolution, but Flareon is also a terrible pet. All of its dex entries just talk about its flame sack and how at any given time it's between 1600 and 3000 degrees. Fire types are always at a disadvantage thanks to the fact that the dex won't shut up about how hot they can get, and you can imagine housing and grooming a pet hotter than magma will be a real pain. After him is Mewtwo. There's already the trouble of having a pet that is smarter than you, and then there's its personality. Mewtwo just flat out hates humans and wants to do everything it can to either avoid them or destroy them. It's an incredibly strong Pokemon, meaning that the only thing keeping it from lobotomizing you is the thin layer of respect it may have that grows thinner every time you ask if it wants to go to the park. It holds phenomenal psychic powers! It will go on a walk when it wants to! The psychic typing is nice and all, but the first time you try to give it a treat, it will trap you in a nightmare dimension, and that's not really what I'm looking for in a cat. You know what animal would suck if it was 100 times bigger and proportionately more of a jerk? 
bees. Yeah, now imagine if instead of fat little limbs, it had weapons that can and will impale you when it gets the chance. Beedrill is a terrible pet. One of Beedrill's defining characteristics is how territorial it is. Pokedex entries talk all about how you should never approach its nest for fear of being skewered on one of its drill hands. Not to mention that bees don't exactly live in normal homes, they live in hives, so you're sectioning off at least half of your house to be a bee drill hive. Also, I don't know if you knew this, but bees aren't exactly solitary creatures, they kind of like to bunch up, so you're not adopting a bee drill, you're adopting a bee drill swarm. Terrible, terrible pet, pretty good mega. The final four pointer is Gyarados, and while he starts life as a docile and downright pleasant Magikarp, puberty hits him like a speeding car in a safety advert and turns it into Gyarados. While the water and flying typing conjures imagery of serene flying fish, the result is anything but. Gyarados is flat out violent and predisposed to violent fits of rage. This is a Pokemon so massive and dangerous that a single one left alone in a lake is big enough news for the best trainer in the world to come out and try and stop it. Now you gotta try and fit it in your bathtub. This thing needs so much space to properly veg out and on top of that you need somewhere that it can let off steam. Not even starting with a Magikarp and then going to Gyarados is gonna help because thanks to Ruby and Sapphire, we know that Magikarps and Gyaradoses have completely different brain makeups, and that when Gyarados rampages, it can go on for months. Clues in the Linnean classification, people, it's called the atrocious Pokemon. Next up are the Pokemon that managed to score five whole points. That's right, guys, we're only four-fifths of the way to getting to a halfway decent dog. First up is Arbok. Now, I know there are serial killers in the real world that keep snakes as pets, but not 11-foot long ones. This thing is massive, and that means almost no comfortable way to keep it anywhere. So I'll just let it roam around my house. Yeah, great idea. Let the 11-foot long poisonous snake have carte blanche on access to your house. If that wasn't bad enough, Arbok Arbok is far from a well-behaved Pokemon. It's so vengeful that once it starts tracking prey, nothing can stop it. Oh good, a vindictive pet! Sorry I forgot to feed you before I went to work, Arbok. It just sort of slipped- <coughs> Arbok! Arbok, we just slipped- that's not an exaggeration either, as Arbok is strong enough to crush oil drums, and if it starts to coil around you, we'll never stop until you're dead. You're probably not built like an oil drum, so there's a good chance that that won't take long. Arbok manages to fail the pet test without even mentioning the fact that it's poison type. Onyx is next, and while it's a snake like Arbok, poison isn't really something you have to worry about. Now dying from a rock slide in your living room, absolutely. Moltres falls into the category of Pokemon where just standing too close to it is hazardous to your health. Its body is covered in open flames that, while making it a real challenge to pet, really excel at burning houses down. This thing usually roosts deep in Victory Road because there was nowhere else to put it on the Kanto map, which means it's at least used to sitting in one place for long periods of time. If you have a big basement without anything flammable like insulation or wood, you might just get away with it, but the big rubber chicken shouldn't be high on your list of potential pets. Golbat comes next, and say what you will about the Pokemon that came before, they don't drink blood. For those of you hoping that Golbat may have just been like a flying fox where all it eats is fruit, nope, those big jaws are meant for clamping around necks. Golbat drinks up to 10 ounces of blood at a time before becoming so fat it can't even fly. 10 ounces of blood is just short of a red solo cup's worth of blood, and if you aren't ready to bleed into a goblet for Golbat, then maybe you aren't mature enough for a pet in the first place. Finally is Aerodactyl, and this comes down to the simple fact that God put these things out of commission for a reason, and it wasn't so some kid who found a funny looking rock could spit shine it and unleash it on the modern day. Aerodactyl is from a time where Pokemon weren't fat little dough balls that just wanted hugs and ketchup, they just killed each other because they were wild animals. It took a long time for Pokemon to become the companions that we know today, and if the Pokemon of Hisui were ready to put children in the ground, I really doubt that Aerodactyl would have the courtesy to leave remains. We have detailed accounts of how how it hunted and even know that when it was revived, it killed about a half a dozen scientists in the process. It's like adopting a dog that shoots half the adoption center on the way out. It also makes a high-pitched shout and that could get the homeowners association on my case, that just sounds eh, kind of annoying. On to six and we finally managed to escape what I would call a horrible pet. We are finally in the realm of bad pets. Leading the way is Tentacruel. So vile was a pretty bad word with vile plume, but cruel is another thing entirely. I named my dog Hatred. You can pet him, he's already served time. 
Tentacruel's biggest knock is honestly not the cruel part of his name. Even the Alolan text doesn't paint him as an especially mean Pokemon, it's the Tenta. 80 tentacles, I mean that 80 tentacles, that are able to trap the opponent and poison them with sharp, stinging pains. So it's a water type that you can't swim with since everything below the surface is guaranteed to kill you. If you can stay out of the water, maybe, but it's got a killer appetite as well since tentacruels tend to demolish the local fish population. And representing one of Kanto's 80,000 poison types is Weezing! Now, seeing Weezing anywhere other than dead last is probably a shock. Shouldn't he be down there with muck and folk like him? You know, Chernobyl with a personality? Well, thankfully, Weezing keeps all the horrible disease to himself, since despite just being three tumors trying their best, Weezing doesn't actually give off any poisonous gas outside of battle. It mixes poisonous gas inside of itself, but when it's off the clock? No need. Then what are these, you ask? Simple. Stink lines. Weezing feasts on bad odors in your house like garbage and toxic waste. We all experiment from time to time. What does it do with all that stinky scent? Make it worse. Sure, you have a living garbage disposal, but tons of dex entries try to impart just how bad this thing smells. Oh, what's that? Oh, that's Primeape. Why isn't he moving? Oh, because he got so angry when I forgot to feed him, he f***ing died! The final Pokémon to get a 6 is Zapdos. This Pokémon usually likes to roost in abandoned electrical plants, but mostly makes its home in storm clouds. At best, you have a pet that's going to visit you when a storm rolls in. Already bad, but the mere act of ruffling its feathers gives off an intense electric charge, and the dex is incredibly specific to say that the thunderstorms it creates are savage. That doesn't mean anything. What does a savage thunderbolt look like? Seven is made up of two Pokemon, and they're two from one of the worst types for pet ownership. It's a creature double feature on fire types. With the exact same grade, Ninetales and Rapidash are the definition of interchangeable. With Rapidash, you have a gigantic horse whose body is covered in exposed flames. With Ninetales, you have a majestic fox with a talent for cursing entire bloodlines. Rapidash enjoys wide open areas where it can run at top speed. Ninetales is described as incredibly vindictive. If you gain a Rapidash's trust, it will let you touch the flames without burning yourself. Ninetales will turn you into a Pokemon if you pull on one of its tails. I went into writing this thinking that Ninetales was good, but... Honestly, I think it should be down with the fives and fours. It's way worse than I remember. Eight is the first real beefy category, and it's where our first starter falls. No prizes for guessing it's Charizard. It's the default answer to what Pokemon you would want as a pet. Charizard has it all! Two Mega Evolutions, which we're not counting since they're tantamount to animal cruelty, a Gigantamax, half its health missing due to entry hazards, the whole kit and caboodle! However, when it comes to actually having it as a pet, oh boy, it's a bad one. First things first, you can't keep any flammable objects near the ground since that swinging tail will light everything it touches up like a Christmas tree. You just tied a lighter to your poodle's tail and hoped for the best. That's all without the hard truth of Charizards. Most of them are assholes. Charizard is a Pokemon predisposed to violence, and no amount of domestication is going to make it not rip your arms off when you don't give it food. It may hurt to hear, but Charizard is just... Such a bad pet. From one Gen 1 classic to another, Nido King is pretty interesting as far as Pokemon go. What with Nidoran male and female being distinctive Pokemon and not just gender swaps like Meowstick, it's somehow morphing into a special attacking wall breaker in Yu Yu thanks to Sheer Force working with Life Orb in a way that makes no sense, and it being almost impossible to pin down what it's based on. I, I want to say Rhino, but we kind of know exactly which Pokemon that already is. Nino King is the first example of a Pokemon who has a pretty basic way to counteract its major flaws. Poison typing doesn't play in as much as you'd think since it's all centralized in its horn, but a lot of the Pokedex entries choose to focus on its massive strength, speaking of it in that classic Pokedex way of incredibly specific comparisons. Did you know that Nido King can destroy a telephone pole like it was a matchstick? The Dex really wants you to know this, it mentions it like five times. It also frequently mentions how Nido King's rampages are unstoppable, and you may be thinking, oh man, gotta put down Nido King, he's gone nuts, well put down that shotgun, Junior as you can fix all of these problems with one simple solution. Get a Nido Queen. Pokemon Swords' deck entry informs us that while, yes, Nido King rampages like an 18-wheeler with the personality of a power tool, it will stay calm around a Nido Queen. 
Nido Queen is Nido King's better half, and while it's got a lot of issues of its own, you may notice its score is much higher than Nido King. This is mainly down to it just being Nido King, but it's not gonna try and fist fight you. So if you're gonna adopt a Nido King, make sure you get a Nido Queen to go along with it. But they're also not small Pokemon, so it's gonna be like you bought roommates instead of pets. Speaking of upsettingly sized Pokemon, Machamp is just Okay, you just adopted a bodybuilder. The pet and owner dynamic gets really messed up when your dog can pick you up. So what are the pros of getting a Machamp? Well, any home invader is going to piss themselves when they see a 280-pound mountain of muscle barreling towards them at Mach 5. It's also proved that these Pokemon can be extremely helpful, since they're used by moving companies to unload cargo. You can get Machamp to move your couch without ever getting off of it. So what's the downside? Your dog wants to practice wrestling holds on you. You have to be freakishly athletic to keep up with Machamp's insane regiment, and hey! Maybe that's exactly what you need! You want to get into shape and a Machamp seems perfect, except that's like wanting to get into a yoga class and then going to an MMA training camp. Machamp is the deep end of sports exercising, so make sure you can already push the plate in your Fortress of Swolitude before you take on this beefcake. Victory Bell seems like a decent pet up until the first time he tries to put you in his mouth and you see the bones and acid inside. Sure, it's gonna take care of pest control, but it doesn't really know the difference between pests and my neighbor Clark, and he plows my driveway when it snows, and I really appreciate that. Marowak is a dog with baggage. You're adopting a dog out of a bad situation, which is really noble, but it's like if an entire dog breed was born into bad situations. Depending on your emotional sensitivity, you might might be able to take on all that Marowak's carrying, but that's a lot. It carries around its mother's skeleton for offense and defense. It has an emotional support corpse. I've met people who collect animal bones, and trust me, they seem like the exact type of psychopath who could handle Marowak just fine. After him is Kabutops, another fossil Pokemon like Aerodactyl, which means there's a level of ferocity you need to account for. Doubly so, since whereas Aerodactyl at least had to open its mouth to start doing damage, Kabutops is always at the ready to gut you with the two health hazards it calls hands. You're gonna need some specialized housing to accommodate it, but as far as prehistoric pets go, Kabutops somehow ends up on the more docile side. It's ruthless while hunting, meaning it's probably gonna mutilate a wild fox or two, but when it's not in combat, it doesn't seem to have much issue. Find a place for it to hunt and swim, and you have a pet approaching decency. The Nines are next, and they start off with Scyther. Giant cleavers for hands, eyes of a murder machine, and it can fly? How did this thing edge out Kabutops? Simple, really. There's evidence of Scyther being a halfway decent pet thanks to the Pokedex. Ultra Moon takes a break from talking about how Gollum likes to suffocate the elderly to talk about how Scyther is an incredibly popular Pokemon in Alola. So if you play your cards right and import an Alolan Scyther, you might just be able to get one that isn't gonna make you look like a Fist of the North Star goon. Now seeing as Alola is the Pokemon equivalent of a Lawless Wasteland, considering how their Pokedex is written, Take that with a grain of salt, we're still not at the Pokemon that make even all right pets. Jolteon comes next, and when it comes to evolutions, there's the good one, the bad one, and then there's Jolteon. Middle Child Syndrome hits Jolteon like a truck. It is remarkably unremarkable. It's practically the middle of the pack in all regards. Mid-tier evolution, mid-tier for electric types in terms of safety. Jolteon represents the shift between Pokemon as pets being, yeah, okay, if you're insane, to, yeah, that's fine, I guess. Sand Slash is starting off the tens, and man, you'd think a monster made up of only edges would have something. Like, even Alola has only okay things to say about it. It sheds its spines a lot, but at the same time, you can sell those to farmers to make tilling equipment. That and it can be kinda lazy and sleep in trees. That's adorable and not blood curdling, so we're moving slowly but surely to good pets. Just cause we're on to decent pets, however, doesn't mean the danger is over since Golem is next. Aside from having a scary lizard face after having a lovable and kind rock face in the last two evolutions, the scariest part of Golem is the same thing that makes Graveler so scary in Nuzlocks. It can detonate itself like a bomb. It uses this to propel itself up mountains, but if your staircase is too steep for its stumpy little legs, there's a good chance it's gonna take out a portion of your building to try to get up them. All that being said, it still may be a worthwhile choice of companionship for the more rural trainers. Golems are known to shed their rock skin once a year, and the discarded rock actually makes the ground a lot more nutrient rich. So as long as you live in a single floor house with no nearby mountains, you can stop Golem from exploding, and then you have a pretty friendly rock friend. Dodrio is like when you have to adopt multiple hamsters to keep them from getting lonely, except it's actually a horrible Cerberus hamster and they all hate each other. Typing is doing a lot to carry these three knuckleheads. For 
First things first, we have conclusive proof that the Ride Online can make for good pets, as your mom in Kalos is a former Rhyhorn racer and keeps one as a pet. Now, how much of its docile nature is down to the fact that she's worked with them for a long time? Well, that's kind of up for interpretation, and the interpretation that is correct is lots. If you really want to ride on, you're gonna have to take a class or two to really understand the ins and outs of its personality. Nothing in the decks is outright state it's a murder machine, just that it's strong and is immune to lava. The combo of ground and rock typing is gonna make bath time into bedtime real fast, but other than that, you can do a lot worse than ride on. Polyrath is your polywog pal with a penchant for poundings as its powerful punches produce pulp out of proud pugilists. While plenty of Pokemon parade around with predatory predispositions, Polyrath pulls back on its puissant powers whenever packed near pleasant people. Though its profoundly protracted practice requires precise proficiencies as to not leave you pooped, Polyrath perpetually provokes pleased partialities from pros. Finally for the tens is Magneton. Let's make one thing perfectly clear. You don't want Magneton as a pet. Well, why is that? And how to get this high on the list? Not only is it a giant walking magnet, meaning that your electronics are done for when Magneton gets close to him, but it lets out a low hum everywhere it goes that gives you earaches if you're near it for too long. What's the benefit then? Well, first off, it's stupid. So you're gonna have a lot of good footage of Magneton repeatedly walking into a wall that it can't even see with three eyes. Then if you're looking for a low maintenance Pokemon, Magneton is your bird. It doesn't need food, water, or electricity like a lot of other electric types. It just kind of floats there being annoying. So it's a bird. Only four Pokemon scored 11 points, one of whom is the final member of the majestic bird trio. But before him is a literal rat. Have you ever felt like inviting a plague into your house? Do you hate having solid drywall? Has the scent of death ever been a welcome smell in your home? Get Eradicate! Radicates are bound to bring in more Rattatas with them, and it does its best impression of a bug type by flooding your house with rats. It's a normal type, which means you don't have to worry about any elemental shenanigans, but what you do need to worry about is the worst temper of any Pokemon thus far. This thing makes Beedrill look like a saint. Radicates are so incredibly violent that if you touch its whiskers, it will attack you, and completely unprompted, it can bite your hand clean off. I've always wanted a hook hand, thanks, Radicate. The only other positive it has is that if you don't take out your trash, Radicate is set on food for a few weeks. Despite everything I make being amazing, you can see that Radicate is kind of gaming the system. That normal typing and ability to eat trash are bolstering the whole angry asshole part of its personality. Hey everybody, it's Doug Trio! My landlord is not going to let me have a Pokemon that is actively destroying the foundation of my house. I have a deposit to pay back, and it's not going to be worth much if the floor is covered in giant trenches. And it doesn't even have the thick, majestic mane of the Alolan version, so my reasons for loving him are limited. That being said, three times the head means three times the love, and Doug Trio is more than willing to love you back. The highest ranking legendary bird, Articuno's just a big cave bird. Believe it or not, unlike his brothers who create thunderstorms and forest fires, Articuno just creates pleasant winter breezes. All you really gotta worry about is housing, cause it's a pretty big bird, but other than that, yeah, pick yourself up an Articuno. Final 11 Pokemon is Cloyster, and you know what animal has never made a great pet? Clams. What am I supposed to do with this? Cloyster doesn't exactly fix that. His best aspect is his typing and the fact that clams are very low maintenance pets. Now, you're not gonna get close to him lest he clamps down on you and skewers you with his various horns, but hey, don't gotta take him on walks. 12 starts with Lickitung and hey, Maybe you can make it work. Normal typing, easy to house due to its small size, eats bugs for pest control, generally not a danger except, oh no, whenever it licks something, it smells like garbage and you'll break out in a horrible rash. Okay, another normal typing that game the system. This isn't looking good. Electabuzz is about the furthest thing you can get from a good looking pet, what with it being a giant mustard yellow yeti with fangs, but reading over its decks entries show a different story. For years and years, Electabuzz has been blamed for power outages by attacking power plants like Electrodes and Pikachus do, but it turns out that but Electabuzz's part in that has been grossly overstated, and it's in fact the failing of the power plants that causes power outages. Electabuzz itself may give you a shock when it goes for a hug, but its real utility comes as a lightning rod. It conducts electricity amazingly, so just set it loose during a thunderstorm and it's all set. Not just that, but it can even create its own electricity by windmilling its arms around, and at that point if you get hit it's your own fault. 
Keeping the theme of big sweeties that look like Satan's razor, Pinsir is a Pokemon that while objectively being just a worse Heracross doesn't deserve the bad rap its horrifying face gives off. While they can be aggressive, simply giving it access to a heated blanket will warm it up to you since it hates the cold. After that, you've got a pretty powerful pal with the ability to split logs and toss cars, which will really improve my ability to get to work on time. Omastar- Please be to the orcs. Snorlax is just a burden in all honesty. This thing wakes up for two things, fighting and eating, and it only does those two things so it can go back to sleeping. Despite that, you're in no danger of being hurt by a creature that can barely recognize that you're there. You can probably sleep on its belly too, just don't wake it up too early or it will destroy God out of anger. Starmie is probably the worst Pokemon for people who need facial expressions to understand emotions. Are you happy, Starmie? Angry? D d do you want some food? Say something for fuck! Sake. It's a lovely little starfish, meaning it's not exactly up to much and is a pet for the owner who doesn't really care about doing anything with their pet. Although it does give off radio signals at random to an unknown source, there's a very good chance you didn't buy a new best friend, you just bought an old police radio. 13 starts off with the Hitmons Chan and Lee. Naturally, two Pokemon so similar are gonna get similar scores, so it really just comes down to which one you like more. Both are gonna run you ragged, but being more disciplined means they're gonna know when enough is enough and treat you to some muscle milk after a long workout. It's a real product, you pervs. Parasect is, um, well, you'd think you're adopting a sort of weird crab looking spider guy, but no, you're adopting the mushroom because the mushroom calls all the shots. So you're telling me I wasted all this money on bug food? Just give it some water and you'll probably be fine. Honestly, if it just sits there, it's kind of hard to tell whether or not you're doing a good job. And to some people, that's the best thing a pet could do. Just look out for the rotting corpse of the bug under the mushroom as it starts to decompose after a while. Psyduck is a prime example of a Pokemon that will never evolve because not a single person on Earth is going to say, Oh man, I love Gold Duck. You're gonna keep this thing a Psyduck because it's either that or deal with a duck that can look you eye to eye. Since he's a little ducky, it's not gonna be hard to house him and it's gonna take a lot less water to keep him happy compared to something like Tentacruel. The major setback for Psyduck is the fact that it's in constant agony. Psyduck may not be a hard Pokemon to care for in terms of food, but you're gonna need to give this thing Advil with a shovel just to try to make it through the day. Arcanine's just a dog. Not the most dramatic of revelations I know, but it thankfully leans way more into the dog typing than the fire. All of its dex entries talk about how fast it is and how everybody likes it, and doesn't talk about how it burns hotter than the surface of the sun. It's still a six foot tall dog, so you're in danger of being smothered to death by its love and it taking up most of the room in any building it's in, which is bad, but it can learn extreme speed. I don't know if that does anything for you, but it can learn extreme speed. Kingler is a really weird Pokemon. You'd think with a claw like that, it'd be just like Raticate who cheated on his exam to get as high as he did. Well, most of Kingler's dex entries just make you feel bad for it, honestly. Its massive claw can rip foes in twain with 10,000 horsepower, which is like getting hit with two of the fastest cars in the world at once. But when out of combat, it can barely move its claw and struggles to do anything. You know those wheelchairs that give dogs who lose a leg? Yeah, just give one of those things to Kingler's Claw and it will probably die for you. The last Pokemon to rated 13 is Seedra, and it's kind of an odd duck, cause in Gen 1, it's Horsey's final form, but even then it had massive middle stage energy. Kingdra thankfully came along and saved the line from being horrible, but that does leave Seedra on the list in a very awkward position. It's kinda got nothing. The most that any deck entry has to say about this thing is that it has poisonous spikes, which doesn't really do it any favors, but it also does doesn't really learn any poison type moves, so eh. If anybody does end up getting a Seedra as a pet, please let me know what it's like because it seems dreadfully boring. 14 not only has the previously mentioned Nido Queen, but the next starter after so long, Blastoise. Appropriate for a Pokemon with artillery on its body, it can be a bit of a daunting pet. At five foot, he's in between Venusaur and Charizard, and that basically means size-wise, it's going to be another person living in your house. Not gonna need any special accommodations, save for just making sure that your doorways are wide enough. Water as well is a pretty innocent type as far as danger goes, don't ask where the water comes from because you're probably just going to be happy to have a quick and easy way to cool off in the summer. More importantly though, don't ever ask Blastoise to blast you directly since a blast from Stoys would be like swapping out a slip and slide for a pressure washer. Also, it's not a good idea to get on Blastoise's bad side since one of the most common words in its dex entries is brutal. Now, safe to say this is a situation where you really need to rile up Blastoise to make him violent, but still, when it can punch holes in thick steel, caution is necessary. You can definitely do a lot worse than Blastoise, but at the same time, there are other water Pokemon without 
without the ability to snipe you from over 100 feet away. Alakazam is one of the oddest Pokemon to consider for a pet as out and out he's just smarter than you are. He knows everything. You're not adopting a dog, you're buying somebody to do your taxes for you. However smart you think you are, Alakazam actually is that smart. All this while discounting the fact that he also has psychic powers. If Alakazam starts to get a brain blast, it's gonna give you a splitting headache. So what's the benefit of having this Pokemon? Well, if you can get to be friends with it, which means it can recognize friends from foes, you get to use one of its spoons, and anything you eat with it instantly becomes delicious. Anything! All that health food that tastes like God's wrath becomes ice cream instantly, and that's going to help you keep up with Machamp, who is still trying to turn your mindset into a grind set. Also, you don't need to take care of him. If he wants food, he'll just go to the store and buy some. It's far-fetched just how high far-fetched managed to get on this list, but when you're basically just a regular duck with a long stick, yeah, I doubt there's gonna be much objection. He might hit you with the onion, but have you seen his attack stat? That's nothing to worry about. You're an embarrassment, Farfetch. Come back when you start to look cool. Sea King! Is there any more nothing Pokemon than Sea King? Like, it's really just a fish. No regional forms, no mega evolutions, no evolutions in different generations. I don't think anybody would ever say they would want Sea King as a pet. To the depths with you, you ugly fish! It'd be an all right pet. Lastly is Tauros. For those familiar with the meta game of Gen 1, you'd know that Tauros is the table. The best Pokemon in the game without a shred of argument to be made in either direction. Nobody beats Tauros. As a pet, he's all right. But like, he's only really lagging in housing and ease of care, but other than that, the normal typing is the best type to be, and he's not temperamental or dangerous. Sure, he could gore you, but when you're the idiot that taunted a bull into attacking you, at some point Darwinism kicks in and kicks you out. 15 marks the official entry into the actually good pets. Everything from here on out would be a good pet that you could give to almost anybody, and they probably wouldn't die. Who better to usher in this era than the best starter pet, Venusaur? Starter question. How big do you think Venusaur is? Honestly, maybe three, four feet if you count the plant in his height? No! Six foot, bordering on six one. But this is a pet that's probably as tall, if not taller than you are, so it's not going to be a great Pokemon when it comes to comfortably fitting in most houses. On top of that, as a grass type, it's probably gonna wanna spend most of its time outside to be in direct sunlight. It's also a good thing to keep it outside as it's poison type. However, in this case, it's not as bad as the usual poison type, which is really, really common in Kanto for some reason. No exposed poison or constantly bellowing gas means that it's probably not gonna drool a highly deadly toxin onto you when it wants to be fed. It's also a combination of pet and incense, as Venusaur gives off a sweet, calming scent from its flower. On top of that, seeing as it mostly feeds on sunlight, it'll be a cinch to feed it, meaning you don't have to break the bank on Venusaur food. Despite the handicap of poison typing, Venusaur's positive traits let it slip into being a good pet, just barely, though. Keep antidotes stocked at all times, regardless of if he's dripping poison or not. Firo is a sad case, since... It's just kind of worse Pidgeot. They're both flying normal birds, which means they got pretty much the same grade in terms of housing and typing. The only major difference is in its massive beak, which is a little less safe than Pidgeot, in the same way that a butter knife is more safe than a butterfly knife. You'd think that its dex entries would talk about how evil and nasty and kind of messed up it is thanks to how much it can hold a grudge, see Pidgeot, but no, most of them just talk about how it's really old, runs away from fights, and likes to carry heavy packages. Between this and Pidgeot, it's really just a matter of aesthetics and I'll tell you I'll take my javelin bird any day despite the fact that I'm convinced they flipped the names in development. The Pokemon that causes fear is named Spiro and the Pokemon that looks like a spear is named Firo. Make it make sense. It's finally time for the big man himself. It's Pikachu! After Charizard, no doubt a lot of people's first choice for a Pokemon partner. It's like how a lot of people say their favorite dinosaur is the T-Rex. Wrong, it's Ankylosaurus. He was a gangster who ankle broke those weak pack hunting scavengers. Pikachu has shown itself to be a great partner. There's more than enough evidence to show that thanks to the several hundred episodes of the Pokemon documentary. Now with Pikachu, you basically get a designer pet since it's not afraid to strut its stuff and cosplay depending on what you teach it. And unlike every other pet that's ever been forced to wear clothes, Pikachu at least looks like it doesn't want to die. Despite being a mouse Pokemon, it's clearly not gonna get that fat little body into a mouse hole, so housing is no concern. It just wants to eat berries and sleep, so it's a little more like a cat than anything else. The electric typing can be a bit of a negative, though, since getting a shock when you hug it is a real possibility. 
However, it's never out of being mean, Pikachus are just generally docile and aren't out to make trouble. The most they're going to do is scorch their berries when they want to eat and shock you a bit when they wake up because they're sleepy. Pikachu isn't a shocking pick for a good pet, but it's at least nice to read a series of dex entries that don't end with It eats 2,000 babies a year! when we get to the cracked end that is Alola. Now, your initial reaction to seeing someone own a Mr. Mime should be, I can't trust this person, and you'd be right because they most likely have very bad intentions, but that's not Mr. Mime's fault. Sure, his Gen 1 sprite looks like Curly from the Three Stooges was cursed by a sea witch to be trapped in gym equipment, but there's a lot more to like. First off, built-in entertainment value. He could do Mime Act. Second off is the fact that unlike a lot of Pokemon, Mr. Mime has the capacity to be helpful. Regardless of whether or not you let him eat at the table, he's gonna help you with the dishes. The worst thing you can expect from Mr. Mime is he's gonna make you walk into invisible walls because it would be funny, and face it, it would be if it was happening to anybody else. And if you don't think it's funny, he'll slap you. Dugong is a funny pick. Have you ever seen what a harp seal can do? Here's the answer, not much. Seals already look like an animal that God had a personal grudge with, and Dugong certainly keeps that up. Its ferocious fangs and itty bitty horn aren't exactly enough to kill anybody, while most of his dex entries just talk about how it enjoys swimming, and how it likes to nap in warm weather to help it digest. While their names may be the laziest of all time, Dugong is an adorable pup. Finally in 15 is Lapras, so you can probably guess that a whole Plesiosaurus is gonna be hard to house since it's not like it can come on land without awkwardly bouncing from place to place. That and getting food for it is really the worst thing you can mark against Lapras. I mean, look at it. It's dutifully carried people that it's never even met across oceans and enjoys human company. The only other problem you might run into is trying to get a permit to own a Pokemon as exotic and endangered as Lapras, but thanks to the repopulation efforts, you won't have to worry about that anymore. This is thanks to the super heartwarming story of a kid who learned that Lapras was going extinct and began breeding and releasing them to try to stop them from dying out, and it worked! All the money you spend on Lapras, though, can be recouped if you open a fairy company. At least you know Lapras will enjoy it. The lone Pokemon to score 16 points, it's Butterfree! Bugs are incredibly good for housing, since whether you want to believe it or not, you probably already have a few bug-type pets in your house right now. A flying type does mean that you're gonna want to keep it outside most of the time, especially given the fact that its main source of food is nectar. That bug typing I mentioned earlier isn't exactly a positive, however, since however many bugs you see, there are 20 more lurking around your house. You get a pet Butterfree, and suddenly you have a baker's dozen worth of pet Caterpie, which isn't exactly a bad pet in and of itself, and Metapod is basically a pet statue. Butterfreeze are also incredibly well behaved, only fighting when it's absolutely necessary so it's unlikely to start biting my son if it accidentally tugs on its wings. If it does get into a fight, however, it has an ability to spread highly toxic dust, which is odd since it's not a poison type, but is still something to consider. It's really only the Kanto Dex that mentions how poisonous it is, however, so if you want to play it safe, you can always get a Johto Butterfree who is bound to be less toxic. And as for feeding the thing, just set it loose on a flower patch and it'll feed itself. You just gotta watch out for its natural rival as it's known to get into heated battles for territory with cutie fly. Heated, you say? Cutie fly is the size of a dime. How is it feuding with anything? 17 is home to a whopping two Pokemon, one of whom could fold the other one up and eat it for breakfast. Clefable may be the first ever Pokemon without a dex entry having a single bad thing to say about it. Kanto, Johto, Hoenn, Sinnoh, Yanova, Kalos, Alola, Galar, even Asui have nothing but glowing praise for it. If Alola's saying that you're docile and nervous, then you know that you're really no danger to anybody. The fairy typing also means that if the stray Hydreigon comes to try and kill you, as it is wont to do, Clefable is able to pile drive it into the dirt. Barely edging it out is Dragonite. This big guy may be the only dragon type in his generation, but that's really the only bad thing you have to say about it. The term friend-shaped was made for Dragonite. This thing couldn't hurt you unless it wanted to, in which case you will be smashed so hard you change star signs. When this dragon isn't demolishing people stupid enough to piss it off, it's helping shipwrecked boats. This comes up so often in its dex entries that it's safe to say this is just Dragonite's hobby. So much so that they've established a supposed island of just Dragonites to take care of shipwrecked sailors on to help them recuperate. While you may not find yourself getting into boat crashes regularly, it's always nice to have a Guardian Angel, or in this case, Guardian Dragon. 18 is here, and we are dangerously close to the really good pets. And there are only four Pokemon between us and the cream of the crop, as well as the cream of the crap, but we'll get to them. All right, pop quiz hotshot, what bird is Pidgeot based on? You may have guessed that the smidgen of pigeon in the name would 
imply this brainless moron, but there isn't really a pigeon that's quite this pissed off. Pidgeot is more accurately an osprey or an eagle, which puts it in the bird of prey category. Now, that name may be a big turnoff since bird of prey doesn't exactly conjure warm, fuzzy feelings, but seeing as falcons, eagles, and hawks aren't the most uncommon pet in the world, it's not the worst type of bird to be. It's no parrot, but it's no ostrich either. Housing this thing is really more a matter of giving it somewhere to roost. It's way more flying than it is normal, so just give it a perch and it should be fine. That normal typing does come in handy as it's a great pet type. You don't have to worry about it shorting out electrical sockets or freezing you to death, it's just a bird. A bird that will die for you. Pidgeots, when trained right, are ride or die Pokemon, as shown when Ash six one on a Fero and proceeds to fight it forever. Aside from that, Pidgeot does have a good track record with humans, seeing as tons of deck entries talk about how popular of a Pokemon it is thanks to its plumage. It also excludes any talk about it murdering people. Pidgeot's company in this tier is Tangela. The tumbleweed with Jordans is just too wonderful for this world. He's pure grass, meaning that unlike every single other plant in Kanto, he's not either spewing poison or psychic waves. He's as basic as a grass type gets in this region. You're bound to have to help him get untangled from a bush every now and again, but that's far from the worst thing a Pokemon has asked you for help with. Plus, if you're ever curious what your pet tastes like, Freak, you're in luck since you can pluck the vines off it with no damage inflicted to Tangela since they grow back within the day. He's just a wonderful little tumbleweed, friend. We're finally here. 19 points and 20 marks the best of the best that Pokemon have to offer in the realm of being a pet. Unfortunately, we're going right to those because we can't cover the Pokemon that scored a 19. Since one of them is Jinx, and I don't care how many of you wouldn't, there are still just as many that would. The other Pokemon is Vaporeon, and I don't trust a single one of you to be adults about this. There are plenty of people who are completely oblivious as to why we're skipping it, and I advise you to keep it that way. The big 20 is here, and now we have the best of the best. The next 11 Pokemon are number one in their field and are what every trainer should hope to have. The first is a Pokemon that somehow conquered the globe, Meowth. While it's unlikely yours is able to hold a conversation with you like the most famous member of its species, it's got plenty of attitude on its own. All this lazy piece of crap does is sleep and obsess over shiny objects, and that is the most true-to-life description of a cat I have ever heard. These two have no thoughts whatsoever except what's that and I'm hungry and I love them for it. Meowths are also quick to befriend somebody with a steady supply of coins and shiny objects. Just give Meowth your pocket change at the end of the week and you've got a friend for life. The only problem is keeping up with its more expensive tastes, but I'm sure you'll find it's worth it. Plus, it can also generate money out of thin air, so it's a good investment. Executor is everything you could ever want from a grass type, and especially a psychic type. For one reason. He's not smarter than me! Finally, a house plant that can't beat me in chess! That's what I'm talking about! This guy is dumber than a bag of hammers! Just real dolt behavior! Three heads are way worse than one, since most of the time the three can't even agree on which direction to go in, leaving it standing totally still. Yes! This is what I wanted! I want a real dummy of a pet! This thing can't blow up my car or dip my soul in acid. He's just a fun-loving coconut tree that likes falling over. This is what I've been waiting for! Leaping past 21, the last three regular Pokemon all land in the 22-point column. First of that trio is Jigglypuff. The absolute worst you can expect from an ill-tempered Jigglypuff is a refreshing nap and a quick face rinse after you get drawn on. Just make sure to give it a washable marker and you're gonna be just fine with this thing. It's small, cuddly, can float around your house, and on those nights where you just can't get to sleep, can you sing to knock you right out. Just don't plan on anything early in the morning because you're gonna need time to wash up. There aren't many things cuter in the pet kingdom than a mother with her child, and with Kangaskhan you have exactly that. This mammoth of a mama has a nurturing paternal nature that not only means she's going to be on her best behavior to set a good example for her kid, but that means you have a package deal. Prove to be a good influence on her Joey and Kangaskhan is bound to warm up to you quickly. The last Pokemon before the top five is every single Pokemon rolled up into one, Ditto. If you were expecting Ditto to be number one because you could have every single Pokemon at once, congratulations on realizing what a bad ending that would have been. Saying that takes away what makes Ditto itself special. It's a lovely little dollop of slime that's just here to be happy. He can turn into whatever he wants, and since it's clearly a process that it enjoys, that means you don't just have any Pokemon, you can have anything. Oh yeah, also Mew is an option, I guess, but like, 
good luck making the embryo from which all life began your pet. Here you can find him either under a truck or at Toys R Us. The moment we've all been waiting for, the end is within sight. We're on to the top five best and top five worst Poke Pets. The fifth worst Poke Pet is one that I'm willing to put money on saying most, if not everybody forgot existed. Don't lie, you didn't remember him. Venomoth seems pretty unassuming. It kind of just looks like Butterfree in a sneaky disguise. Not the case, all down to one distinction. Swapping flying for poison changes so much. Bug needs all the help it can to stay out of the trash can, but poison slam dunks it in like Shaq. This thing will get lost in your wall, and before you know it, weeks later you'll have 20 Venonats, which is a responsibility you're not ready for. What ruins everything this Pokemon is going for, which, reminder, is nothing, is the same thing that doomed Vileplume. Every single flap of this thing's wings disperses massive amounts of poisonous dust. Just moving is going to kill you! Oh, surely it can't be every single time. Every. Single. Dex entry, save for Hoenn, just gives a guide on how this thing is going to kill you. Getting a Venomoth is the equivalent of getting a loose tank of carbon monoxide as a pet. Spot 5 for the best pet, however, is... Slowpoke is the couch potato's dream. This thing, which the wiki states is a cross between a sea otter, baby hippo, and a giant salamander, three peas in a pod, Slowpoke is the closest thing to a pet rock in a universe with living pet rocks. All it wants to do is laze around and sunbathe. You can't do anything to make this thing upset at you, because by the time it realizes it's mad, it will already have forgotten what it's mad about. Just sit on the couch with a bag of potato chips in Season 4 of Monk, and Slowpoke will sit by you the entire time. Or, if you are a literal psychopath, you can lop off Slowpoke's tail with a hatchet and eat it. Don't, though. It's, it's just weird. It won't feel the pain, but... Why are you eating your dog? Burning up number four on the worst side is... Old Booby Boy just happens to have a trend that follows fire types like the plague, and that's the Pokedex boasting about its body temperature. Magmar is the worst for it though, as it clocks in at 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. At the temperature of molten lava, Magmar just existing is gonna burn your house down, melt your flesh, and make sure the only thing your family has to bury is ashes. It gets worse because the fire is one thing, but his bad attitude is way worse. He's a bit of a jerk, and when upset, will start breathing fire until whatever is making him mad is gone. Just touching it is enough to give you a burn that will last the rest of your life. Don't just stay away, actively avoid Magmar. Coming in at number four on the good side, though, is bound to make a lot of people upset given the fact that he's technically already been on the list. Now, Gyarados has already appeared in this list, in fact, these two nearly bookend the list, but Magikarp getting his own spot is down to how the Pokemon games go out of their way to show off Magikarp as a pet. It's a super boring pet, sure, but that doesn't mean it's not rock solid. Magikarp is beautiful in its simplicity. It swims back, and it swims forth. It can splash, but not to much avail. After wave upon wave of Pokemon threatening to dice you into cubes, burn you to cinders, and give you a body slam, fish that just swims is practically perfect. And what it lacks in excitement when it comes to moveset, it makes up for in palette. There's a veritable smorgasbord of varieties they come in. Heck, it's one of the few Pokemon in the list that has a theme song. The other, Slowpoke. I really hope the last three have theme songs or this is going to be a dangerously moot point. At number three for the worst Poke Pet is... Yeah, you knew Muck was coming. He was going to be here sooner or later, and now it's time to face facts. Of all of Kanto's Poison-type Pokemon, which I think is like all of them. Muck is hands down the worst. Arbok will strangle you, Vileplume will infect you, but Muck is just walking, talking, hazardous waste. Walking is a bit of an exaggeration though, as he just slinks around like a slug, which is, no doubt, gonna leave a trail of sludge wherever he goes. You thought Magmar was bad for being unpettable? You can pet a Muck, you're just gonna look like the goon from Robocop afterwards. Muck's entire body is made up of poisonous waste, and even being near it for too long will require you to take the week off to recover. And you wanna know what the worst part is? You have to feel bad for it! Since the Pokemon world is a work of fiction, pollution is on a downturn, and as a result, Muck's population is dropping fast. They've started building new ponds filled with just slime to try and keep them alive. So, bottom line, don't get a Muck. Just sponsor the conservation effort. As for number three best, I'm sure just about everyone was waiting for this one. I mean... 
Duh, right? It's Eevee. I've called almost every Pokemon up until this point a dog because I think calling Onyx a dog is funny, but Eevee is just a dog. A dog with an unstable genetic structure, but in the real world, we just call that a pug. Eevee is soft, friendly, can sit comfortably on your head without hurting. Imagine doing this with a Mastiff, but most of all harbors a genuine love and affection for anybody who gives it in kind. Maybe even a little too much love. No prizes for guessing Alola has a way to ruin this thing. In Ultra Moon, it says that Eevee's DNA is influenced by its surroundings and that its face will slowly change to look like its trainers. What? I don't want to wake up one day and see my bouncy boy sleeping in my lap only for him to turn around and face me and I'm looking back. That's horrific, but I can't hold that against Eevee too much. That's kind of just how his body works. You can't hold everything against the number two worst Poke Pet, however. Of course it's Gengar. Who else would be so low except Kanto's sole ghost type? Gengar may also be poisoned, but trust me, most of his crimes are on the ghost half of the equation. Gengar straight up kills people. Mach and Magmar and Venomoth at least, at least could say they didn't mean to hurt anybody. Not Gengar. Gengar is actively hunting people to kill. It hangs out around street lamps, dark alleys, even your own home just to get a chance to kill you. That's actually the only thing saving it from an even worse score. It's extremely easy to house because it's already in your house. You're only going to find out when it's too late. It will curse you, hunt you, haunt you. And even the deck says that if a Gengar picks you to kill, it's too late and you should make its job easier. Gengar is one of the few Pokemon smart enough to know that it's being evil and it just doesn't care. Don't just avoid Gengar, get a Pokemon that can defend you against it. Hopefully the number two best Poke Pet can do the job. Good luck ever finding this thing since it's locked in the depths of the Safari Zone. Chansey is as loving and caring a Pokemon as it comes. There's a reason they're predisposed to becoming healthcare professionals. Chanseys are by their nature caring Pokemon that give out eggs to those they see as friends or who are injured. These eggs are produced several times a day and are considered highly nutritious. Oh, so it's fine when it comes out of a chicken, but when a giant pink blob does it, you have an issue? Chansey is all but the perfect pet in every category. The only thing keeping it from number one is the fact that number one just has slightly more pet-like qualities. Chansey has more companion qualities. Wait, no! Chansey has more companion qualities. And finally, you've probably sussed out who it is. The worst Poke Pet is... What else really needs to be said? It's Hypno. It carries a pendulum-like device. There was once an incident in which it took away a child it hypnotized. As a matter of course, it makes anybody who meets it fall asleep and has a taste of its dreams. Anybody having a good dream, it carries off. Avoid eye contact if you come across one. It will try to put you to sleep using its pendulum. Hypno is not only the worst Poke Pet in Kanto, it's got a really good case for the creepiest Pokemon ever made. It's not cool looking like Spiritomb or cute like Mimikyu, it's just some yellow diddler with a long nose. Not to mention, because nobody gives a f about Hypno, most people who don't know any better put his negative traits on Mr. Mime, who is just a fun-loving clown critter. Meanwhile, Hypno is on a government watch list. I wouldn't blame anybody for reporting their neighbor to animal control if they had a Hypno. It is, by its very nature, up to no good. But what Pokemon is the other side of the coin? What Pokemon takes the top spot with such authority? One that's easy to house, has a great typing, is well behaved, is no danger to you, and is easy to feed? Well, it can only ever be one, and if you've been keeping track up until this point, you already know who it is. The best Poke Pet in all of Kanto is... That's right, the best Poke Pet is the one we made ourselves. Porygon is the perfect pet in every regard. Housing it, it lives in the computer. Not just that, but it's from the 90s. This thing is 100 megabytes, tops. Typing, pure normal. It can use conversion, sure, but not unless you give it the firmware update. Behavior, Porygon has only ever been helpful, eating corrupted files and acting as a living firewall. Safety, it's a tiny XE file. What's it gonna do? The worst thing you could ever get from Porygon is accidentally getting poked by one of its sharp edges, but even then I hear they're working on an update to address that. And ease of care? Just download some JPEGs and MIDI files to feed it. This thing is as easy to care for as it is to surf the web. It's perfect in every way. So what are we taking away from all this? 
Is it that beauty is in the eye of the beholder and my system for determining a Pokemon's worth is different from yours? Uh, that any Pokemon with enough love and attention can be sculpted into the perfect partner and friend for life? No. It's that Digimon wins, baby! Pop the champagne! It's Akumon o'clock, mother Woo! It's gonna be the death of my career, let's do this. Electro, Diglett, Nidoran, Mankey, Venusaur, Attacta, Fioro, Pidgey, Sea King, Jolteon, Dragonite, Ghastly, Ponyta, Vaporeon, on Polyrath, Butterfree! I'm always doing the Pokemon, you can't make me do any more! I'll search across the land, look far and wide, release from my hand the power that's inside. Venomath, Poliwag, Nidorina, Golduck, Ivysaur, Grimer, Victor Bell, Moltres, Needle King, Farpetch, Abra, Jigglypuff, Kingler, Rye, Hunkle Fable, Wigglytuff! Oh, this is so much harder than I thought it would be! Zubat, Primate, Meowth, Onyx, Geodude, Rapidash, Magneton, Snorlax, Gengar, Tangela, Goldbean, Spearow, Weezing, Seal, Gyarados, Slowbro! Oh! This is so bad. Kabuto, Persian, Paris, Horsey, Radicate, Magnemite, Kadabra, Weeping Bell, Ditto, Cloyster, Caterpie, Sandshrew, Bulbasaur, Charmander, Golem, Pikachu! At least 150 or more to see the Pokemon Master of my Destiny! Alakazam, Doduo, Venonat, Macho, Kangaskhan, Hypno, Electabuzz, Flareon, Blastoise, Poliwhirl, Oddish, Drowsy, Raichu, Nidoking, Bellsprout, Starmie! We're only halfway through? Jesus, no! Uh, break time's over. Here we go! Metapod, Marowak, Hakuna, Knuckle Fairy, Dodrio, Seedra, Vileplume, Krabby, Lickitung, Tauros, Weedle, Nidoran, Machop, Shelter, Porygon, Hitmonchan! Articuno, Jinx, Nidorina, Beedrill, Haunter, Squirtle, Chansey, Pokemon, Parasect, Execute, Muck, Dugong, Pidgeotto, Lapras, Vulpix, Rhydon! At least 150 or more to see to be a Pokemon Master is my destiny. Okay, let's get this over with. Oh, God. Charizard, Machamp, Pinsir, Coughing, Dugdrio, Golbat, Staryu, Magikarp, Ninetales, Ekans, Omastar, Scyther, Tentacool, Dragonair, Magmar! Oh, this is the worst thing I've ever done for a video! I regret this so much! 24 more to go! It gets tricky here! Sandslash, Hitmonlee, Psyduck, Arcanine, Eevee, Execute, Kabutomp, Zapdos, Dratini, Growlithe, Mr. Mind, Cubone, Graveler, Voltorb, Gloom, we're almost home! Up now. I'll be so awful if I messed up now. Charmeleon! War Tortle! Mewtwo, Tentacruel, Aerodactyl, Ammonite, Slowpoke, Pidgeot, Arbok, that's all, folks! I'm done. Oh, God, this was a bad idea.